welcome all and each one of you. Uh, my name is Anna Simeon. I'm here with Raven, Respecting Aboriginal Values and Environmental Needs, who is one of the co-hosts of your webinar. I'm joining you from the Lekwungen traditional territory of Vancouver Island. And I'm absolutely delighted to be co-presenting this webinar with Stop Ecocide Canada. Raven's mandate is to raise legal defense funds for Indigenous peoples that use the court system, the Canadian court system, to protect their lands and their rights. And our ultimate goal is to reach a, a state where the laws and life ways of Indigenous peoples are respected and happen on the land, live on the land. And at that point, there will be no need for us uh, to be there any longer. But in the meantime, it's a long journey and there is no better partner to be uh, doing this journey with than uh, Stop Ecocide Canada, which is also working in the legal system on, in another field. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Lisa Aldring from Stop Ecocide. And thank you again for joining us and being here with us tonight. Thank you very much, Anna. And many thanks to Raven Trust for co-hosting this um, important webinar. My name is Lisa Aldring from Stop Ecocide Canada. Um, I'm speaking to you from Treaty 7 territory here in the Rocky Mountains. And these are the traditional lands of the Stony Nakoda, uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Tsutana Nations, as well as home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And the Stop Ecocide campaign is a global movement with just one objective, and that is to establish an international crime of ecocide, which would recognize severe and widespread or long-term damage to the environment as a crime under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and I think like you, Anna, we would love to be uh, done out of our job and achieve our goal and step back. Um, but here we are. There's no doubt that severe environmental damage is contributing to the climate crisis, to the collapse of biodiversity and to threats to our, the life support systems of the earth. And obviously the crisis poses risk to us all, but the impact of environmental destruction are not felt in a vacuum. And that's why we're here today. These are heaped on top of deeply embedded inequalities, many of which are rooted in colonialism. Um, a racialized analysis, if we zoom back, it demonstrates how the crisis is linked to economic and political frameworks that have systematically disregarded the rights of indigenous peoples, people of African descent and others. And at a global level, uh, I was startled to sort of reflect on the fact that developing countries will bear 75% of the costs and losses associated with the climate crisis, despite contributing only 10% of emissions. Uh, and a UN report recently even warned of the risk of climate apartheid, where the wealthy and privileged escape the worst effects of the climate crisis while vulnerable communities, people of color, indigenous peoples bear the greatest impacts. Um, at local levels, environmental injustices can be insidious and appear smaller in scale, but we know that the impacts for uh, already marginalized individuals and communities can be profound and long-term. And I just wanted to cite as one example, a recent UN Special Rapporteur uh, report that called attention to incidents in Canada, and here I quote, of persistent and health devastating exposures to toxic pollution as a result of discriminatory decisions to place polluting industries and landfills near Indigenous and Black communities, unquote. And so we can't address ecocide without addressing environmental racism. Uh, a recognition of an international crime of ecocide won't resolve all of these issues, obviously, but it is one important and pragmatic part of the solution. It would signal a moral and legal red line in terms of the most um, egregious acts of destruction of the environment and help correct a gaping accountability gap. But I think it also could be uh, pivotal in addressing environmental injustices 
serving to support mechanisms for achieving justice at local levels, um, frankly, where they matter most, and as a catalyst for systemic change. So we're very grateful uh, for our incredible panelists and to our moderator, who's up very late uh, in Croatia, and really looking forward to hearing your perspectives and your insights. So thank you for your time. And over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks to everyone who's joining today. We can see you entering your names below. We really appreciate you taking the time um, to be with us. I think it's always important for us to come together. And though we may be working in different spaces, um, this is something that connects us all. Um, the, you know, just devastation that is happening to the land and all the ways in which we're working to protect that. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce myself. My name is Suzanne Daliwell. Um, for the past 16 years, I've been working in solidarity with Indigenous communities, uh, mainly in the tar sands, to internationalize what is happening there um, and to work to hold corporations and banks accountable for their violations of rights there. So having an international community is really a key part of this work as well, seeing how we can um, work together to, to bring this um, future healing that is necessary. So I'm going to introduce our panelists um, before we begin so that we can start. And first of all, I'm going to introduce Chief Roland Wilson. Um, and a few amendments to this, so hopefully you'll give us some updates as well as you go. Um, Roland Wilson is the chief of the West Moberly Lake First Nation, located in northeastern BC, and currently finishing his seventh consecutive elected term, 21 years in total. He's been involved in the legal protection of treaty rights under Treaty 8, relationship building agreements, MOUs, EBAs with the province and Canada, as well as impact benefit agreements with industry for his community. In the Treaty 8 territory of BC, the First Nations are faced with massive resource extraction challenges from forestry, oil and gas, mining, large scale hydro, electric facilities, pipelines, wind farms, as well as agricultural development, all the while struggling to keep the balance between development, economic and business opportunities, and while ensuring the protection of treaty rights and self-preservation of his nation to be able to carry on a promised way of life guaranteed under the provisions of Treaty 8. So welcome, thank you for being with us today. And also I want to say hello to Tamara. Uh, Tamara's joined us um, very last minute notice and stepping in for a dear colleague, so we really appreciate you. Tamara is a fellow with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. She's a long time environmentalist, feminist and peace activist. Last November, like many of us, she attended the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow as part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom delegation. Tamara has a Master's in International Politics and Security Studies from the University of Bradford and a law degree and MBA from Dalhousie University. She's the co-founder of East Coast Environmental Law in Nova Scotia, and Tamara is currently a PhD at the Belsile School for International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, and her research specifically relates to global climate governance. So thanks for being with us. Um, we actually have a third panelist um, who's going to join us soon. I'll just briefly introduce them. Um, Chrissy Isaacs is a Grassy Narrows mother and land defender. And Chrissy was one of the initiators of the Slant Lake blockage in 2002, now Canada's longest running logging blockade. Chrissy is also a singer, artist, mentor, community worker, and educator. So they'll be joining us shortly. So I wanted to um, open the floor up to you, Roland, first. Um, and the first thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, we're talking about the, the mass destruction of, of territory, of land. And for many people who are not directly affected by environmental racism, this can often seem quite abstract and foreign and be a concept rather than a reality. So could you tell us how environmental racism actually feels? What does it sound like and taste like in your community? 
Well, uh, thank you, Susan. I tell you, it sucks. <laughs> um, so I, a little background, uh, uh, my nation is located in Northeastern BC, British Columbia. Um, we're in the heartland of uh, the oil and gas industry um, for the province of British Columbia. Uh, we have uh, two large scale hydroelectric facilities on the Peace River. There's a proposed, well, there's a third one under construction right now, which uh, we're opposed to. And I'm gonna probably speak to quite a bit. Um, we have coal mine. We have just about every resource development uh, opportunity other than uh, um, ocean stuff going on in Northeastern BC, mining, forestry, you know, and it's all kind of taken a toll. And as I mentioned, it's Treaty 8 territory. So my nation adhered to Treaty um, in 1914, but our people, the Danizaw people, have been here since uh, what, time immemorial. You know, uh, we have physical evidence of our people being on the land 13,000 years ago. Uh, there's a place in Fort St. John called uh, the Charlie Lake Cave. Um, there's physical evidence that was discovered there that dated that uh, time of people being there 13,000, I think 13,500 years ago was a carbon date that they put on there. It was our ancestors that were there. They hunted the, mice, the mammoth that walked here. Um, you know, we have oral history stories about that. So as development happens here, um, the, the nations have to walk a line between carrying on a traditional cultural way of life and participating in the modern day um, activities of what's going on. You know, uh, you know and I, I relate that to the fact that I own a pickup truck. You know, I have to drive to and from work. I'm on a computer. <laughs> I'm doing this as a webinar off my computer in my house, you know. So, you know, I, I enjoy the the benefits of the modern day civilization, but you have to understand with that comes impacts on it. And some of those impacts are necessary and some of those impacts are unnecessary. And, and it's the unnecessary impacts that uh, um, are pose the, well, they all pose a problem of uh, concern, but it's the unnecessary impacts that are hard to deal with. You know. Uh, Site C, as an example, Site C is a third uh, dam on the Peace River under construction right now. Uh, our nation, actually it was all a treaty at, at the time of the announcement of Site C was opposed to it. We're all still opposed to it. Um, it's just some nations have, have uh, kind of thrown in the towel on it. West Mobile is the last one um, that's actively suing the province right now on trying to stop the dam. So it's the dam, I guess first and foremost, we're not opposed to the creation of the energy. What we're opposed to is the unnecessary destruction of that valley. And it's the last remaining piece of the Peace River Valley that we have that's closest to our community and that's actually functionally used by our people. Um, the river is the main artery, the, the Peace River is the main artery that flows through our through our territory. Most of the rivers dump into it. Um, so there's a huge interconnected web of um, connectivity with it. You know, the animals move back and forth around it. Um, with the previous dams that have been constructed that WAC Bennett was built uh, was commissioned in 1968, I believe, and went to full pool um, sometime around 1970. And it's created the, one of the largest man-made reservoirs in, in North America. It uh, encompasses a huge territory in it. And, and the result of that, it, it generates the power. Uh, they say it, it lights up one in three light bulbs in the province of British Columbia. That's all big, it's a pretty major infrastructure project for BC. Uh, the creation of the Wilson Reservoir fragmented the caribou. 
uh, migration pattern. So now we are in a, a kind of a state of emergency. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if everyone knows about the uh, um, caribou agreement that was re uh, recently struck back in 2000, I think it was 2020, uh, between Canada, BC, West Wolwe, and the Soto First Nations, our sister nation, neighboring nation on Mobley Lake. Um, there were thousands of caribou around us. And when they find Wilson Reservoir, it fragmented caribou and created uh, a southern population, a northern population. And the, the creation of the energy that was produced from Site C allowed forestry, mining, and oil and gas to kind of grow. So the, and all, all that happening, uh, caribou were a, a pretty important animal for us. Uh, you know, we utilize them, we utilize the, um, every aspect of the caribou. And now they're endangered, we're no longer allowed to hunt them. There's, I think, 207 caribou remaining in the southeast. You know, um, there's 300 members, 300 plus members of West Wolby First Nations. And if we all harvested one caribou, we'd wipe out the population. So we can't, we can't. Uh, legally can't harvest caribou right now, but ethically we wouldn't harvest caribou. We stopped harvesting caribou a long time ago. So when you talk about environmental racism and put that in there, you know, the benefits of WAC Bennett come at a cost. And, and those costs for us are pretty significant. You know, it's a violation of treaty, right? We were never, back then when they, they did that in 1970, they didn't even tell the First Nations what they were doing. You know, uh, there's evidence from uh, nations that are on the other side of the reservoir that they weren't even told that they were flooding. You know, they woke up one morning and the river was flooding and they figured it was a spring runoff uh, from the thaw and, and they were moving back from the river uh, as the waters rose <laughs> and the waters never stopped rising until, you know, and, and never went down and they wound up their community was located way up, up, up on the banks, um, you know, miles from where they were. Nobody ever came and told them what was going on. I was uh, CK uh, First Nations there. Um, there are people who are kind of, the, kind of the same. You know, we understood what they were doing, but nobody, nobody had any inclination that they were going to uh, the you know the fish were going to be poisoned with methylmercury. We can't eat any of the fish out of the Wilson Reservoir. I've got a bit of a presentation, a couple slides that I, I wanted to show, but I'm not sure. Should I do that now or should I do that later um, on? Yeah, we could. You could do that now. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So, and you know, and trying to understand this is. Uh, the effects of environmental race and ecocide. Uh, we're people of the land, the Dunyzaw people. There's not just Dunyzaw, there's, there, we're, there's uh, Cree people living here, Slavey. Um, but I am Dunyzaw, my community is Cree and Dunyzaw based. Uh, and, and you know, so we're people of the land. We hunt, we fish, uh, we still trap, you know, and, and the treaty was to protect that. And, it's amazing how many people talk about the treaty, but nobody's ever actually read the document and understood what the treaty means. And anybody who has, they always go to this one clause in the treaty that says cede and surrender, which is a controversial uh, clause in the treaty because those, those aren't words that are used either in the Cree language or the Dinosaur language. There's no word to talk about surrender or cede of land, so they couldn't understand. Nobody would have understood what that meant at the time. Um, maybe what I'll do is if this works. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Oh, so right here. There. So that little peace in the treaty that says see and surrender, nobody understands or takes the time to understand that there were promises that were made to the, the indigenous people, the First Nations people of, of this area to entice them 
to sign treaty. And this is one of the promises that was made. And it, it, it basically says there would be no forced interference with your mode of life. You can hunt, fish, and trap after you sign the treaty as if you never entered in the treaty, and, you know, and, and not be forced into any kind of a situation. And that contradicts the seed and surrender clause in the treaty. You know, they're all promises that are now have to be taken into consideration when you talk about the treaty. You have to understand that these are, this is what was promised to the First Nations to get them to adhere to signing the treaty. And right across Canada, this is an issue all over the place about how government uh, is not doing this. Here in Northeastern BC, we have the uh, Blueberry River First Nations a recent court case where they sued the province uh, of British Columbia for uh, treaty infringement on commutative impasse, and they won a landmark decision on it. You know, and it, it identifies the fact that uh, they never took in, they haven't taken into consideration our our interests while they were doing all this. You know, extracting the resources that they wanted, and creating all these jobs. They just kind of pushed the First Nations off to the side and. And, uh, you know, we feel, I had an elder tell me this one time, uh, it's kind of like you, you, you're living in your house and somebody shows up one day and they start moving in and they, they move your furniture around, they reorganize your, your living room and, and uh, take your blinds off your walls and hang up new blinds and they just kind of push you out the door and take over your home. <laughs> and, that, and he was relating that because that's how he he felt here you know we don't we don't have any say in, in what goes on you know when they were doing site c we were trying to have a discussion about well let's you know if you need the energy let's talk about other means of providing that energy and they you know we had the premier at that time christy clark actually stand up in public and say you know we're the they're the voices of no, we're going to push this project beyond the point of no return and, and make it happen and create jobs so everybody in the, everybody could have better lives, except for us. You know, they <laughs> pushed us off to the side. Um, I just, I have this in here. Sorry, I'll, I'll try to be real quick with this. Uh, this is uh, the hunting and fishing regulations for uh, the province of British Columbia. And, and in the... Uh, regulations, it has this uh, warning, this mercury warning. I, I mentioned earlier that the, all the fish in the Wilson Reservoir are contaminated with methyl mercury. Uh, can you see my cursor moving around? Yep, we can. Okay, so this here is the Peace River. Uh, well, this is the Wilson Reservoir. This is the Peace Arm of the Wilson Reservoir, and Moberly Lake is right here. So we're the closest community to the actual infrastructure, WAC bed at Peace Canyon. Um, you know, Peace Canyon uh, is down, uh, this little piece right here is Peace Canyon, and this, the rest of this piece is going to be Wilson Reservoir. But this is a, a mercury warning about fish in the Wilson Reservoir, and its tributaries about being in contaminated with methyl mercury, and, and uh, consumption of methyl mercury is not healthy for you. High consumption is really not healthy for you. Uh, it, uh, severe cases of methyl mercury poisoning cause miramatid disease, uh, you know, and that's grassy narrows. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with grassy narrows, but that's the big thing that's happened with them. You know, they've been poisoned with methyl mercury and they have mir uh, miramatid disease. Uh, so this is the extent of the Wilson Reservoir and the uh, These red lines are, are the, uh, this is how much the methyl mercury expands. It's not just in the, meth, in the Wilson Reservoir, which is this, this blue piece in the middle here. They call it Wilson Lake, but it's actually a national reservoir. So when you look at this, you can start seeing the expanse, the cumulative impact of the Wilson Reservoir and what happened to it. Um, you know, and, and caribou. Uh, I, I talked earlier about caribou. Um, 2014, there's 425. 2021, there's 217. So uh, in that short amount of time, 
seven years, we lost over half of the population of the caribou in the South Peace. And this is a, just a real short little video, if that's all right. It's about a minute long. Uh, and it just kind of uh, shows you the progression of development uh, in the in the Peace Territory. Uh, all these little dots represent uh, a lease site. This yellow here are mineral tenure, uh, coal mining and mineral tenures um, there. You'll see it around uh, 1970, the world's this big blue area here will show up as Willis Reservoir. This spot here is Mobley, uh, the Mobley Lake. This is Soto First Nations and West Mobley First Nations. You know, so this is one of the gas development northeastern BC primarily for what's been going on. And uh, it ends, uh, it was, this is all the government information, public information that we took off the, off the internet and compiled it uh, and made this presentation to show what's going on in Northeastern BC. Uh, Blueberry River First Nations has one almost exactly the same as ours. And this boundary zone, this red zone, is uh, the five watersheds that surround uh, the Wilson, uh, the Peace River. And you can see it stops at the year 2015. And 2015 to current date is around the time when shale gas started getting developed in Northeastern BC. And shale gas is another Big, oh, sorry. So this is, this is Mobley Lake right here in the, in the amongst of this. Blueberry's up in here somewhere. And, you know, when you look at cumulative impact of what Blueberry's gone through and, and Doig River First Nations is up there. Halfway River First Nations is our sister community. Um, they're located right up in here on that. So. Environmental racism and how it makes you feel, <laughs> it, 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 it's hard to explain. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. Unless you experience it, you know, everybody talks about, well, yeah, everybody needs jobs. You know, we're not opposed to the jobs. We're, what we're opposed to is being felt like uh, strangers in our own land. You know, and the whole site seed development was, uh, it's not, it's not a needed development. We wanted to have a, have a conversation about, well, let's talk about geothermals, you know, let's, yeah. let's do these other things. So yeah. I'm not sure if I answered anything there. No, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to, to ground ourselves. And I think that's a really important part of developing this, this climate literacy, you know, often at the COPs, we hear these projections into the future, um, but it's really important to ground ourselves into the land to hear those histories of destruction and also the rupturing of the relationships. And so we need to hear about the, yeah. the specifics of the spaces and the relationships that have been ruptured. Um, and also, you know, exactly that it's, really telling that you mentioned it's the peace river we're talking about the disruption of the peace and that relationship with that land as well so you definitely helped us um yeah ground ourselves as we begin this conversation and i just wanted to pass it to tamara for a while um yeah just what have you experienced i know you work on a a global scale um what have you witnessed that is happening in terms of this environmental racism on a global picture Thank you, Suzanne. Well, let me begin with uh, a land acknowledgement and some appreciation. So I am very grateful to uh, Stop Ecoside Canada and uh, Raven Trust for including me and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute in this important web webinar. I um, am very glad to be with uh, Chief Wilson and I hope that Chrissy is able to join us as well. I am speaking to you from Waterloo, Ontario. This is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the neutral peoples. And I very much 
acknowledge and appreciate the fact that it's indigenous people who are on the front line defending the land and the water. Um, like uh, Chief Wilson and the West Moberly First Nations, and of course, uh, the Wet'suwet'en people as well in Northern British Columbia who are trying to stop the coastal gas uh, pipeline. And Chief Wilson's uh, description of environmental racism being uh, the state and corporations taking over and destroying your home uh, is very apt. And I would like to share a little story. Uh, where I live in Waterloo, it's uh, two hours away from the former military site called Camp Ipperwash. So it's 150 kilometers straight westward to the shores of Lake Huron. And during the Second World War, the uh, Canadian government and the Department of National Defense expropriated uh, 200 acres from the uh, Stony and Kettle uh, uh, First Nations and uh, created this um, military base. And they promised to return the land to the First Nations after the war. But of course, they didn't. And they uh, didn't compensate the people for the loss of land. And so it took a decades long struggle for the Indigenous people to try to get this land back. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, the Kettle and the Stony uh, Stony Point First Nations, you know, they did a protest march. They walked all the way to Ottawa, for instance, demanding the land back um, it, by the early 1990s. And then in 1993, they decided to set up a, a, a camp at the base and, and occupy the base uh, to try to, to, to gain it back. And um, this led to, you know, very intense struggle over two years. And then on September 6, 1995, um, an unarmed Indigenous man by the name of Dudley George, who was uh, supporting the camp and the occupation of the base, was killed at the base by the Ontario, uh, the, uh, uh, Ontario police. And, um, and it took another 10 years for the federal government and the province of Ontario to establish an inquiry into uh, the military base and into the killing of, of Dudley George. And then it took another 10 years, um, you know, in 2016 for the federal government and the province to um, to uh, compensate the uh, First Nation community and to give the land back. But when the government returned the land to the people, because it was so highly militarized and it was used for um, military training, uh, weapons testing, it was extremely degraded and it was littered with exploded and unexploded ordinances. So now the First Nations community have this land back, but they can't use it and they can't develop it. And it's going to be several more decades for the Canadian government to remediate the land, uh, remediate the land fully. Now, this expropriation, this theft of land from Indigenous people, the militarization and the environmental destruction, really, of this land at Camp Imperwash, is an example of what has happened across. Canada, other military sites are exactly the same across Turtle Island and by the Canadian uh, state, by the Canadian military in, uh, you know, in Indigenous communities uh, throughout the global south. Um, I'd also just like to quickly uh, tell you a little bit about the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute because it's a new organization in Canada. It started two years ago by concerned activists and academics. We are very much opposed and critical of Canadian foreign policy. Um, despite what the Trudeau government says, this this uh, very nice rhetoric that our handsome prime minister uses, like peacekeeping, feminist foreign policy, human rights, democracy, promotion. If you lift that facade, if you follow the money, you know, you will see that behind it are very aggressive 
uh, uh, corporate interests, like, for instance, from Canadian mining companies, uh, oil and gas companies, and very aggressive uh, military operations. And these uh, Canadian corporate uh, uh, corporate interests and, and, and military operations have created environmental uh, the destruction or forms of environmental racism in, in other, uh, other uh, countries. And we see that there is a, a connection and a consistency between Canadian domestic policy and Canadian foreign policy. The racism and violence against uh, by the Canadian government against indigenous people, poor, vulnerable people, minorities in this country is linked to the racism and violence by the uh, Canadian corporations, the Canadian state and the Canadian military against uh, poor and vulnerable uh, people in developing countries uh, overseas. So, you know, we believe very strongly that we need a, a collective action. We need collective uh, solidarity to uh, resist what the Canadian government is is doing and to bring about a, a, a foreign policy that is genuinely grounded in, in human rights, in peace, in social justice and environmental protection. Great. Thank you so much, Tara, Tamara, for that detailed history and global picture that you've painted of the way in which, you know, we really have to have an international movement to hold Canada accountable. And I think you really spelled out the how deeply intertwined, um, you know, they're inseparable, this commitment to working as allies alongside Indigenous sovereignty struggles, both within Turtle Island and internationally. And I can echo that sentiment that, you know, the, the Canadian government is often seen as this peacekeeper, it's brand um, internationally. People are so shocked when they hear the extent of the ongoing, um, you know, devastation, racism of the current Canadian government, as well as its re recent history and how that um, turns into global mining operations globally. So I think that's something we really need to think about is how do we continue to also connect the international resistance um, against Canadian extractive industries globally? And how does that relate back to what we're seeing on the ground in Turtle Island as well? So thank you so much for that, that detailed um, legal underpinning. And I think that really sort of takes us into this, this picture of where we're going, um, you know, we, we know that one of the root causes of environmental racism has been this um, historical, the ongoing colonial structures that exist for Indigenous Black and POC people. Um, what, oh, what can we do to move towards the future? And what are some of the remedies and strategies that you're already using um, to tackle environmental racism? And also be great to hear, what do you think um, the role of an international crime of ecocide could be. So I'll pass that to you first, Chief Wilson. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's a big question. Um, well, the UN made, made UNDRIP, United Nations Declarations of Rights of Indigenous People, uh, that, that was a start. Um, out of that, they developed FPIC, uh, Free Prior and Informed Consent. Uh, you know, and those those are are when that happened, everyone everyone was excited about it. Now, I've been I've been chief. I'm starting my twenty second year here, so it, it, I've heard iterations of this over and over through the years, right? Saying something is one thing, but doing something is much different. Uh, you know, so the province of British Columbia, there, this this new government that's in place, was, I shouldn't say new, it's it's newer of the, the NDP government um, actually made it part of legislation, UNDRIP. 
you know, and they were the first province in Canada to do that. But that being said, they're still just words. They, they have to start implementing and changing, you know, saying sorry and not actually changing, uh, you know, changing your actions doesn't mean anything. You're not really sorry. So it's, it's uh, I've always, I've always thought that there should be a world court that holds holds com countries or industry accountable for things. Um, you know, because what's what's happening here, other people don't know. Like, right? what's happening to us is is you know, on the grand scale, of what's going on in other countries where they're actually, you know performing genocide on people and wiping people out. It, it's, it's not, you know, I don't want to make any claim that this is as bad as that. It's not as bad as that. But, you know, we are still a people that are being uh, suppressed. And, and uh, you know, it, it, when I drive to, to, from my home to uh, the, the local, uh, township here that has the major shopping centers and stuff here for St. John, I have to drive through the Peace River Valley. And every time I drive through there, it breaks my heart to see what's happening there. You know, they're, they're destroying the river valley. And I know that there is absolutely no need for it. You know, we can reach all the energy requirement that the province needs, thinks it needs, through all these other more uh, eco-friendly, responsible developments in partnership with the First Nations, not, not how, it, how it went. Uh, you know, they, they approved the project and then they came and talked to us, you know, and they called that consultation. And, and when you look at what consultation should be, it should, consultation to me should be the dialogue that gets you to the decision. You don't make a decision then come talk to us and then call that consultation. That's that's a mitigation process, not a consultation process, you know. And and then berate us because we don't want to have that, you know. Uh, like she put the the previous premier publicly stood up and berated us and and made us feel inferior and and less. Um, they're just words, but they're still, you know, our elders felt hurt our children were upset about it you know and when you look at what's going on here you know uh, uh williams lake first nations just made their declare uh, announcement that they've discovered 93 possible 93 burial sites of the, at the uh, the school down there and you put that in the context of what's been going on with the first nations um you know it's just another little notch on the on the belt of impacts and atrocities committed against the indigenous people and you walk around the world it's that way you know the the, the indigenous people of australia you know um, you look at any country that has an indigenous population look at how the um settlers i guess treat them you know they, there's not too many places where they they were uh, incorporated things, you know, and it, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it, did I even come close to, yeah. I went off on a tangent. No, I think it's really, thank you. It's really crucial, um, points you brought up there. And I think to think about the, the tools that do exist and how they're failing, for instance, UNDRIP, how it continues to actually you know, fail to actually uphold the rights of Indigenous people. And with FPIC, um, some of the work we've been doing has been, you know, to enforce FPIC in terms of banks and corporations that have been going in the tar sands. And that's a long process mm -hmm. um, and hasn't kept up with the speed at which we need to um, stop both the eco side and also the ongoing um, disruption of the ability to live in in those territories peacefully. So I think those are really important um, mechanisms that you've brought up 
in terms of how we need to now increase the pressure and as you mentioned the need for an, an international court um yeah so i'm going to pass over to tomorrow there to also could i just yeah. before you? yeah uh, sure. so that that's always been the thing you know they they make gun drip you know the this provincial government legislates it but what does that uh, what does that mean how does how do they you know they did do all that but yet still they're they're building site c you know mm -hmm. they're still going on. they could have stopped before that you know they were they the the premier had stated you know if this doesn't make sense we'll we'll stop and he, he gets elected and keeps going and then you know he uh, apologizes for it literally stands up and says you know i'm not the first one that's going to disappoint yeah the first nations won't be last so there has to be some kind of way to hold them accountable hold it accountable right and that's just there's no interest in seeing that happen exactly and that's exactly what we're talking about here which is scaling up the the processes and means of accountability great okay so i'm going to pass over tomorrow i wanted to give you some space to also think about some of the um, strategies and solutions that you've already been working with and how you think a crime of ecocide could support in the protection of the land and be an ally alongside these sovereignty struggles. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. I'd like to answer that uh, question by sharing a little bit about the campaign that the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is working on. And that's the campaign to stop the Trudeau government from buying a new fleet of fighter jets. So right now, the Trudeau government is evaluating bids uh, between the Lockheed Martin F-35 and the Saab Gripen to replace Canada's aging CF-18 uh, fighter jets. This procurement is the second most expensive procurement in Canadian history. The price tag is $19 billion for 88 new combat aircraft, but the life cycle cost will be about $77 billion. And the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is very concerned about this purchase because we know how Canadian fighter jets have been used over the past um, over the past 20 years. In 1999, uh, Canadian fighter jets illegally bombed uh, Serbia. They used uh, munitions with depleted uranium. The, uh, the, uh, the, the Serbian people have said that they have uh, had increased rates of cancer because uh, NATO forces use munitions uh, uh, with depleted uranium. Uh, we uh, bombed civilian infrastructure, we killed civilians in 1999, and then Canada and other NATO forces uh, bombed Libya in 2011, and uh, totally destabilizing and destroying one of the wealthiest countries on the African continent, leading to a humanitarian and refugee uh, crisis with uh, thousands and thousands of Africans dying in the Mediterranean, trying to, you know, flee the civil unrest. And it was Canada that led the NATO bombing in, uh, in, in, in 2011 of Libya. And uh, we also used uh, our Canadian fighter jets to bomb uh, Syria and Iraq from 2014 to 2016. And the Canadian aerial refuelers, uh, 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 provided all of the fuel for US-led coalition forces to bomb uh, Syria and Iraq for another uh, three years. And, you know, tens of thousands of bombs, uh, again, uh, were dropped on these two countries, on Syria and Iraq, again, you know, destroying infrastructure, uh, killing and injuring people. So we very much don't want Canada to buy a new fleet of fighter jets. But another reason why we don't is because uh, these fighter jets, uh, Canada's current fleet of fighter jets are stationed at the Cold Lake Air Force Base. And this is in Alberta, uh, three hours north of Edmonton. Uh, the Cold Lake Air Force Base uh, is Canada's uh, largest Air Force Base, one of the lord largest in North America. It's, 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 it's very busy, but uh, people should know the history of um, how the Cold Lake Air Force Base 
uh, was created. In 1952, the federal government and the Department of National Defense, um, without consultation or consent from the Dene and the Cree, Cree people, expropriated, stole 3 million acres, a huge swath of land from uh, across across uh, Al uh, northern Alberta into Saskatchewan to create the Air Force Base and to create the Cold Lake Air uh, Weapons Range. And, uh, the, uh, the, again, the government promised to return the land in 20 years, but uh, they did not. Um, and so the Cold Lake First Nation, the uh, Beaver Lake uh, First Nation, you know, started, uh, you know, demanding a return of the land. And um, the, the uh, federal government uh, just ignored their pleas. And this land, again, was considered sacred land. This land was used to sustain their their traditional way of life. They used it for, for, for hunting, for trapping. Uh, they had summer and winter camps. You know, this is, they, they, can, they, they, they uh, traveled through uh, the territory. And, um, and uh, the, the, the uh, federal government and the Department of National Defense refused to compensate the people for uh, for taking this land, for using this land, for fighter jet testing, uh, you know, for bombing and for targeting practices. And then finally, in 1991, there was a, a um, land claims commission set up. And if you read the testimony from that commission, I mean, you hear uh, the testimony from the First Nations people, you know, talking about the despair and the impoverishment and, you know, the harm to the communities that was created, you know, by the loss of land and the loss of uh, their livelihood. Um, the, the, this air, uh, air weapons range and Air Force Base also had an adverse impact on wildlife. So it uh, caused the decline in the population of the boreal caribou. And the boreal caribou was very important uh, for the uh, First Nations communities there it was very that the land and the wildlife, you know, uh, considered sacred and very much a part of their culture and, and, and their identity. And so the loss of the land, the loss of their traditional way of life, uh, it was absolutely devastating. And then it wasn't until um, until uh, about 2005 that there was finally a, a settlement. The federal government gave uh, the First Nations communities there $25 million uh, for the land. This was a pittance and they never returned the land. So this land continues to be militarized and this land is in Tar Sands territory. People should know that there are two main uh, bifurcated uh, pipelines from the tar sands. One of the pipelines goes to Edmonton. This is to fuel the consumerism and the capitalism. The other pipeline goes to Cold Lake, and this fuels uh, the militarism. And so, um, uh, people should know how uh, this fighter jet purchase is going to continue the militarization of uh, the land of the Cold Lake First Nation, the land of the Beaver Lake Cold Nation, uh, the, the other First Nations and the Métis uh, of Treaty 6. Uh, this land, you know, has been uh, absolutely devastated. It's contaminated, it's bombed, there's craters, there's again unexploded and exploded ordinances, you know, littering across the land. It's dangerous for people in wildlife. And it's not just the Canadian fighter jets that are flying overhead, causing noise and disruption, you know, today, but uh, uh, Canada's NATO allies, you know, from Britain, from the United States, they're bringing their fighter jets and testing it. So this is, you know, this is a prime example of environmental races. This is a prime example of, of ecocide. And, you know, this is just, again, just one example. There are many more of these examples across the country. And sometimes, you know, we think of just the, the corporate, um, 
the corporate devastation contributing to ecocide, but we very much have to remember uh, the, the militarism. And so I think uh, one of the one of the solutions is, you know, is allyship. Uh, last August, I went up to Cold Lake to observe the Air Force Base, to meet with the Cold Lake First Nations people, to talk about the impact, uh, you know, the cumulative impact of this uh, Air Force Base and what a new fleet of fighter jets will mean uh, for this community. And what the Canadian foreign policy thinks should be done is that this Air Force Base and weapons range should be closed down. Uh, it, it, the land should be given back to the rightful owners. The land should be given back to the Cold Lake First Nation, to the Beaver uh, Lake First Nation. I mean, these are the best stewards of the, of the land. Uh, uh, really, this militarism has been uh, has really caused uh, 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 caused a death of the land and has caused you know despair of the people and so we need to demilitarize we need to disarm we have to stop the purchase of these new fighter jets we need a new politics of of peace both here at home in Canada and internationally so we are appealing to a listeners on this call you know to check out our website we have a petition please tell the Trudeau government um, you know, to shut down the tar sands, to shut down the Air Force bases, and to start working, you know, cooperatively and diplomatically to, you know, to heal the land, to heal these relationships, you know, to, to, for mm -hmm. genuine uh, reconciliation with Indigenous people. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your passionate presentation there, Tamara, and for that information. I think this is a really crucial part of environmental justice and climate literacy to bring in the dimension of the impacts of the military and I think it's something that you know can really bring together our, our peace movements and our land movements and sovereignty movements and just literally how those uh, land uses land abuses lay on on top of each other so I appreciate you bringing that um, dimension to it and I'm also interested just one last element in terms of when we're talking about a crime of ecocide and you both mentioned this of that we need that international court how do you think the law of um, ecocide could intervene in in that context what's with these questions holy cow <laughs> uh wow um well i think you could get a room full of lawyers talking about that one mm -hmm. uh, from from my experience what and i, I speak on the context of the, the of a treaty first nations and rights that we have uh, our rights under the treaty are protected by the Constitution of Canada. And the Constitution of Canada is, is supposed to be a sacred document. You know, you're not supposed to bend or violate the Constitution anywhere. And in that, there's actual uh, law in government that the uh, the government body cannot make a decision that violates the Constitution of Canada. And that, the, the, you know, everybody brags about, about Canada and, and its uh, democracy. And, but when it comes to that, they don't violate the Constitution of Canada, except for the when it comes to Indigenous people. The treaty right is uh, protected under the, under the Constitution. So the all this, all these impacts, the Blueberry River First Nations court case and stuff like that, those are all violations basically of the Constitution of Canada, you know, and, and they don't hold themselves accountable to that, you know. And when UNDRIP announced, uh, when the UN announced UNDRIP, you know, Canada actually didn't sign on to it right away, and you know nothing was done. We've had the the rapporteur from the UN come to Northeastern BC. We've I, we've talked to him. We sent a delegate. Uh, we sent a delegate all the way over to Geneva, 
and had a, one of my counselors made a presentation in Geneva uh, to the UN to talk about, you know, what, what does it, what do these words actually mean on it? So like, it, when you look at genocide and what happens in, in, in countries where they've tried to genocide out um, a group of people, you know, the uh, sanctions come down on, on the country and, mm -hmm. and you know, the pretty heavy, uh, I guess, commercial restraints are placed on them, you know, and, uh, but when it comes to something like this, it's kind of fluffy. Yeah. Well, it's not kind of fluffy, it's real fluffy, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, right now, there is actually no way, no legal way to uh, defend against a treaty infringement, yeah. right? Site C is an actual, it's a treaty infringement. There's no if, ands, or buts about it, but you can't stop the infringement. There's no legal mechanism in the courts of law to stop the infringement. The only thing you can do is sue for damages after the infringement happens. So they, they just continue to infringe. And then it, it becomes the responsibility of the First Nations. So it's West Wolway's responsibility, the members of West Wolway, uh, to hold them accountable. You know, and that's where we're suing BC and Canada and BC Hydro, the current corporation, you know, the, they've got billions of dollars. You know, we have to partner with an uh, organization like Ravens Trust and, and they're running uh, fundraising campaigns for us to, help us in, in our court battle. <laughs> you know? And it's literally, it's, it's uh, a David and Goliath, but there's three Goliaths that we're fighting, you know, not just, not just one. I don't know if any, I'm a movie buff guy, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, The Hobbit, where uh, Bilbo Baggins gets sent up against the big three trolls, you know, and that's <laughs> how, what we're, what we're facing here. You know, we, they, they get, to be the narrative of the story and you know and and we have to poke holes in it but there's no they're supposed to justify the infringement they never justify it you yeah. know so mm -hmm. what could equal side law like i don't i don't know mm -hmm. um what it could do like thank you i think i think it's really what you've done there is illustrate the vacuum of accountability and why we need an international court to be able to um, intervene within especially Canada and these sites of extraction and just to echo what you were saying um, you know even with the a, a disaster as big as the BP Gulf disaster even the fines um, that were enforced from that didn't even touch BP um, they just sold a few projects and continued so no, even the market it. forces don't you know have an impact so I think it's really really crucial that we yeah elevate this um, call for accountability so we're yeah, just gonna thank you so much for that um, yeah it's it's important for us to look into these vacuums in order to see what we we do need. So yeah, tomorrow, just gonna give you a chance to also respond to that. Well, the law of uh, ecocide and a new court would provide a very needed and important tools in the toolbox to hold our um, Canadian mining companies, for instance, uh, the Canadian military accountable because they're very much shirking responsibility uh, here. Uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is very concerned and monitoring uh, uh, Canadian um, mining companies overseas. Uh, I'm sure many people on the call are aware that uh, Canada uh, how, uh, headquarters, 75% uh, of the Canadian mining companies on, uh, for instance, the, the Toronto Stock Exchange. And there are currently about 4,000 Canadian mining operations, uh, 
you know, throughout the global south. So in Asia and the Philippines, in West Papua, in Africa, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, and um, in, uh, of course, in, in Latin America, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Brazil, uh, Chile, Argentina. And in all of these places, these Canadian mining operations have been sites of human rights abuses and environmental devastation. And uh, these corporations have not been held accountable um, by the Canadian state or Canadian courts. Um, the Trudeau government uh, in 2015 at the election promised to establish an independent um, ombudsperson to, uh, you know, try to um, to investigate it and uh, affect some sort of accountability by these Canadian mining co companies. But it was uh, just in the last couple of years that the government, you know, finally established uh, the uh, the ombuds uh, person's office, you know, this is called the um, the Canadian Ombudsperson for a Responsible Enterprise. And it was only last year that uh, the the core Ombudsperson, you know, has been starting to investigate cases. So the Trudeau government, you know, has delayed action. So we need more tools uh, to hold hold our corporations accountable for the really egregious environmental harm and human rights abuses that they that they are um, that they are engaged in. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's something we really need to emphasize at this point is that the call for a crime of ecocide is to make these activities which destroy land, which destroy waters, criminal offenses. You know, that's what we've been doing. We've been chasing for accountability by trying to appeal to the economic argument, the, the human rights argument, but without a mechanism to enforce that crime, which would be the enactment of ecocide as a crime against peace. That will, have, will be how we'll actually get this to be um, the criminal accountability for that. And I think somebody just mentioned um, that this should be broadcast on, on Bloomberg. And I think that's a really important point is that corporations um, and banks and states that are violating territories in this land need to understand that this law is coming down the pipeline and investors need to understand that. So they, they begin to do due diligence on their investments to understand um, projects that violate um, these, these rights of communities are no longer going to be economic feasible and we've seen that with climate change you know we're seeing that projects that will be um you know fined or taxed or have carbon taxes on them we're seeing corporations begin to move out of those projects not at the speed that we need but this is something that could happen with ecocide that we start to put corporations and banks on notice that as this crime um comes into being as it begins to be enforced that this will have economic consequences as well so i think that's just something thank you for the the comments that are coming up um, in there so we have about five minutes left um, and i know some of you have been um, putting your questions in and i've got one here that i want to share to you both as we wrap up here um, so I, yeah we've been talking a lot about ending ecocide, about bringing these injustices to a halt. So just wanted to sort of maybe get your your picture, your image of what do you hope um, can happen in the next, say, 10 to 15 years? How do you see these injustices? Um, and, you know, this is a chance to dream a little bit, <laughs> just to sort of, you know, really put your, your vision out there. And that could include um, you know, what are your calls from the allies and the, the people that are tuned in today? What are some of your calls to them? Well, for, for the First Nations here, um, we have always strived to be part of the decision-making process. You know, um, that the, there's always this as soon as we start making headway there and everybody jumps up and says, well, the First Nations can't have a veto. We can't have a veto on decisions. We have to, you know, and, and BC has this, uh, 
they have to be able to make decisions. We can't fetter the decision makers. At, at some point in time, and Blueberry, the Blueberry case kind of, I think, sets this bar on this, that there is going to be a veto. You know, they're, they've crossed the threshold on, on development here in Northeastern BC. And, it, and the judge was very clear on that, you know, and, and the province uh, made an amazing, you know, to the uh, amazing decision there not to appeal the court case, you know, which was kind of a, it, it was a shock. Like we all, everyone was hoping that would happen. But when it happened, it was like, oh, wow, <laughs> that was a, a little unexpected, uh, you know, and they didn't appeal it, you know, so now they're sitting down and we're having discussions, you know, and we're trying to get from being uh, a stakeholder relationship to a, uh, a, a decision making relationship where uh, we're collaboratively having discussions and making decisions together about how things should go. And, you know, and that was what we were trying to do. The, the Council of Treaty 8 Chiefs was trying to do with BC and BC Hydro when they announced Site C. We wanted to have this discussion about, okay, well, what is the actual need? Like, is there a need here? Um, you know, because prior there was no need. You know, it, is this, uh, is this a, an actual need or is this a want? You know, and should you be allowed to do this kind of a development, create this kind of an impact mm -hmm. on a want, or you know, it, or is there an alternative to that? And you know, and but be able to say at some point in time, we have to be, have the ability to say no. That's just not say C is not acceptable. You know what's going on over at Cold Lake? Not acceptable. And you know, and what's happening now is we say no, and they just kind of close the door and they go, <laughs> they go and do whatever they want, anyways. You know, say, well, we talked to them and we took their concerns into consideration and, you know, we made, we made a decision. And, and that, in, in like, if I, I could snap my finger and change it, like change the world right now, it would be that for that those that are impacted the most have a bigger say than yeah. having the least say on it you know um, thank you thank you for that clear clear wish clear prayer to put out there thank you and tomorrow i'm going to pass to you because i know you have a time constriction so just wanted to give the floor to you as well before you leave us uh so I, I would like us to hurry. Uh, I think that we need to go faster than 10 or 15 years. You know, we're uh, fa facing a catastrophic climate change and the ecological breakdown, and we, 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 need, to, we need to hurry. Um, so I would like to see us show more courage and more uh, solidarity. We definitely need uh, lawyers in the court, um, but we also need uh, more people on we need more people on the street. So we need uh, people to be braver, to uh, follow the lead of indigenous people who have shown how to get things done, you know, with occupations, with blockades, with uh, nonviolent uh, uh, resistance. And we're going to need to engage in, in, in more of that. Um, and uh, I noticed somebody in the chat said, we need things like, um, elect uh, electoral reform and uh, political change. We need to do really all of it for the kind of transformational change that we uh, uh, desperately need. And I would like uh, us to uh, lead with love and to lead with uh, humor, because that's how we're going to bring uh, more people in the movement and make the connections to other movements and to other groups and across borders uh, that we need. So uh, I look forward to uh, working with all of you for this kind of change that we need for a peaceful uh, green um, society and, and future. And uh, let's, you know, continue to roll up our sleeves and, and have the courage that's, that's needed to, um, to do what it takes. 
So thank thanks, you. thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Tamara and Chief Wilson, for all the insight. And I just want to sort of, you know, people are asking what are the next steps, and you can sign up for the um, email list to stop ecocide to get the newsletters and um, to learn more about that. And I think it's really important that we realize that even in this digital space, we've begun to do that work. There's so many people here from around the world who have been listening this evening by understanding that, you know, whatever part of this movement that we're doing our work on, that we're connected by our allyship with the communities that have been resisting colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy since day one, that we stand with you and that that is at the core of this movement globally. Um, also, that, you know, by sending this message internationally, this call for accountability of the Canadian state, that this story is widening out and that Indigenous people globally who are being devastated by states such as Canada, um, that we hear you and we connect our struggles and that we continue to put forward this vision of this need for international accountability. So I want to thank you all for being part of, you know, weaving this future together today, for sharing your stories. And I really look forward to building this movement with you in the future. So thank you so much, everyone. And again, make sure you sign up for the email list. And there's also some links to more information about site Dam C um, and also um, some of the, the militarization campaigns that were end militarization campaigns that were listed as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Udro, sinala. <laughs>